Okay, I think we'll get started. Um, can you hear me? Okay, it's loud enough? Yeah. So, listening to the um, screencast that we finally managed to record last week, I heard, heard the, the sound was distorting slightly, so I've tried to turn down the, the audio level a bit. And hopefully it's going to be better for, for this lecture. Uh, today, Stefan is here as well, who will be giving the second half uh, of the course. So he'll be with us from, from now on. And we'll take over in two or three lectures. So finally today, we're done with the intensive Common Lisp crash course. Uh, um, so hopefully the pace today will be somewhat slower than for the, the previous two uh, lectures. And today we'll finally be starting to uh, uh, we'll turn to some some more sort of theoretical uh, conceptual uh, things, namely something called semantic spaces, which uh, um, hopefully you'll know the meaning of by the end of uh, today's lecture. So this is what we're going to be spending our time on today, and also partly the next couple of lectures, and also for the next obligatory assignment, which will be out later. Tonight, actually, when the, the deadline for the first uh, assignment is out, or is it due? So the main question will be um, we'll, that we'll try to tackle is: Can we make a computer program automatically learn the meanings of words? So without providing any sort of prior knowledge to the program, can we have the program itself? Um, learn or infer what words have similar meanings and what words have dis dissimilar meanings just by looking at data um, of actual language use. So just by providing data, providing examples of, um, of how language is actually used to the program, the program should be able to itself um, form a model of what words uh, are semantically similar, what words have the same meaning. Okay, so how can, how can we do this? And how can we um, represent the meaning of words in a mathematical model? How can we, in a sense, quantify to what degree two given words are semantically similar, to what degree they mean, they mean the same thing? And a solution to all of these questions is what you'll all be implementing for uh, assignment 2A and what we'll be, uh, be talking about today. So sort of in terms of main theoretical concepts that we'll um, cover today, we'll start by talking about something called distributional semantics and the so-called distributional hypothesis, which is um, um, an approach or an idea to, to have the semantics of words, or how, how word meaning can be, um, uh, can be modeled. Um, We'll talk about something called vector spaces, which is sort of a general mathematical model for representing uh, uh, problems or, or data. We can use vector space models to represent basically um, arbitrary data, but in our case, we'll use vector space models for representing words and word meanings. And by coupling sort of word semantics and this idea of, of vector space models, uh, um, we'll get something which we call semantic spaces. Okay, all of these things are probably, um, so vector spaces, some of you maybe, uh, uh, some of you have worked with before. Uh, these other concepts are probably new to most of you, but hopefully these things will mean more to you by the, uh, by the end of today's, today's lecture. Okay, so let's um, start by taking a step back and look at this thing called the distributional hypothesis. Um, so this is an old idea <coughs> within linguistics and uh, the philosophy of language. And the distributional hypothesis, it sometimes it's also called the contextual theory of meaning. And it's typically introduced by giving one or all of these three citations. Uh, citations which have uh, introduced numerous papers in, uh, and books in linguistics and natural language processing. Um, the first is by Wittgenstein from 1953, from uh, uh, meaning is use, 
Another one from Firth. You shall you shall know a word by the company it keeps. And one more by Harris. The meaning of entities and the meaning of grammatical relations among them is related to the restriction of combinations of these entities relative to other entities. Okay, so basically what all of these quotes mean is that that the semantics of a word or, th or the meaning of a word uh, has consequences for how we can use that word, right? So we, um, for a word like uh, paper, it makes intuitive sense for us to say things like fold a paper or draw on a paper, but saying things like to drink a paper or to uh, sing a paper, that sounds odd because there's this mismatch in terms of the semantics of the words and the construction that we uh, put that word into. Um, and on the other side of that coin, of course, that means that um, uh, by looking at the combinations of other words that a word enters into, or by looking at the context in which a word is used, um, we can infer something about the meaning of that word. Okay, so this is not very mystical stuff. It's fairly, fairly intuitive and obvious to all of us, right? So if you take an example, if you all read this sentence, he was hung, out, hung over after drinking too many shots of Retavarif at the party last night. But none of you have heard the word Retavarif before, because it's, uh, it's a phony word that I just made up. But still none of you will have any problems uh, uh, telling me what that word means. right? So it, it's obvious to all of us that Retavarif is some sor um, sort of alcoholic beverage. Um, uh, probably a fairly strong one, since you can have shots of it. It's typically something you do with, uh, with liquor. Um, and this is obvious to, to all of you intuitively. You don't even have to think about it, because uh, uh, by just looking at the context in which we use the word, that we've had shots of it, you've been drinking it, mm -hmm. you're hung over by it, you had it at the party, it's, it, it's obvious, uh, given what we know about the world, given our background knowledge about the world, uh, it's obvious to us that... Uh, that this refers to some sort of alcoholic beverage. But it, it's interesting to know sort of how we actually, how we're able to, to arrive at that conclusion, right? Because we do that simply by, by looking at the context uh, in, in which this word occurs. And that's something we can take advantage of um, when designing computer programs that we want to, to have some idea about the semantics of words. Okay, so so the main hypothesis here, the main ID in this distributional hypothesis or the contextual uh, um, theory of meaning, is that if, if two words share similar contexts, then we can reasonably assume that uh, those two words also have similar meanings. Um, and the nice thing about that is that it re reduces the, the, the problem of, comp of um, comparing meaning to the problem of just comparing the contexts in which something occurs. Um, and that again lets us eliminate this need for, for encoding sort of prior knowledge uh, about words in Trimodal. All we need to do is find some effective way of uh, recording uh, properties of the context in which words occur. And then by comparing those contexts, we should be able to say something meaningful about uh, the semantics of the of the words observed in those contexts. Okay, so um, well, this idea is sort of fairly simple and goes um, it's not anything new; it goes way back. But still, what is new, or at least more recent, uh, about this is that sort of given the processing power that we have today and the, the sort of vast amounts of electronic texts, we can now suddenly put these ideas into uh, into practice at a at a large scale. Um, which is what we'll be doing for the next assignment. Okay, so let's just first sort of quickly rush through how we can sort of set these ideas out in practice in terms of programming this or making a, a, a program take advantage of, uh, of these ideas that we just sketched. And then we'll go into uh, spend the rest of the lecture going into all the all the details and how exactly uh, uh, we'll be doing this. But the general idea then is that we'll um, we'll start with a corpus, a large corpus, 
um, a corpus meaning just some large collection of texts. And then we'll have some set of words that we want to that we want to model, some set of words that we want to be able to say something uh, say something about in terms of what they mean. And so each of these words that we want to model will be represented by a set of so-called features. And each feature in turn will record some property of, of the contexts in which we observe the words to occur. And it will be up to us to decide what those properties will be. So we get to design these features. We get to decide um, uh, what features we'll use for uh, um, and what parts of the, the context of the words that we'll, that we'll be rec recording. And then in the end, we can then compare these features that we have extracted for the various words, and then say that words that are, that are found to have similar features um, uh, will also have, have similar meanings possibly, or um, uh, that's what we'll, we'll find out. But there are, of course, many open questions here. So one thing is, what do we mean by similar? How do we model the similarities of features? And wh what does it mean to have similar meanings? Words can be similar in many different ways. Um, and there will be many different ways to compare these sets of features to each other. So that's one thing. Um, we'll need to look at, and we'll also need to look at how to represent these things. How do we represent the set of features that we extract um, for a given word? And that's where these vector space models will come in. But first, we'll start uh, with something even more basic, um, namely, how do we define context? That's something that can be def defined in many different ways. So this will be related to these features that we extract. Um, and even more basic, how do we define a word? We haven't really said anything about that either. What really counts as a word? What do we, what do we mean by a word um, in practice? That can also be, be several things. So these are a couple of design decisions that we need to, to get out of the way first, and then we'll turn to, uh, to the question of how to represent all of this, um, and then finally how to actually implement it in practice. Okay, so first let's look at if, um, um, some different ways of defining context and some different ways of um, defining these features that we want to use for representing the words in our model. Okay, so um, we'll be using this uh, example sentence, I bake bread for breakfast. Then imagine that the word bread is one of our target words. So one of the words that we want to to represent in our, our mathematical model of, of word meaning. Okay, so the, the question now is, what features do we extract for the word bread in this sentence in order to, um, to, uh, to represent it in our model? Okay, and the, the most straightforward and simple way of defining context is to use something called uh, context windows. So what we do here is that we define context to be the neighborhood of some given number of words, uh, both to the left of the word and to the right of the word, of our focus word or our, our target word. So in this case, we're looking at the word bread. So if we define the context to be um, plus minus one word, for example, then we might end up recording features like this, that to the left of our word, uh, we have bake. To the right of the, of the word bread, we have uh, the word for. Okay, so these would be the features extracted for this particular occurrence of the word bread. But then obviously, we'd, we also have many other occurrences of this word in our corpus, in our um, text collection, in our data. So in the end, we will have, hopefully we'll end up extracting a bunch of different features like this that will allow us to characterize um, the meaning of the word bread in some way. Um, and there are a bunch of different variants to defining context windows like this. Like, like this. So we could use distance weighting, for example. So let's say we take n to be two or three instead of just one. Then we could say that i should count a little less than bake, for example, since i is further away from, from the target word. Um, we could also use 
n-grams so instead of recording single words like bake so recording the fact that bake occurs to the left of bread we could record um, uh, the fact that I bake occurs to the left for example okay another way of defining context is to use something called a bag of words approach this is probably the simplest simplest approach to defining context um, and also one of the approaches that is mostly used so in a bag of words approach we would define the context to be simply all the other words occurring in the same sentence with the target word um, uh, without any regard for the uh, the linear ordering of those words that it's we don't care if they're to the left or to the right or if they're uh, far away or if they're close to the word we just say that any word in this same sentence uh, form part of the context of bread so we'd be recording features like this I and bake and for and breakfast these would all be be features for for this occurrence of bread and again there are different variants we could use we could choose to record all words at either the sentence level like here or we could um, include all other words in the document level even so saying all the other words occurring in the same document um, um, will correspond to context features for for bread okay one more um, approach to how we can define the grammatical context of a word is to look at grammatical relations um so the idea here for example for for bread would be to first perform some sort of syntactic analysis of this sentence so that we'd be able to to uh, record information like the fact that bread is a direct object of uh, the verb bake for example so this would require um, some deeper uh, linguistic analysis and some more pre-processing um, than a simple bag of words approach or a sliding window approach but it would also allow us to to uh, record much more sort of precise uh, much more precise properties of the uh, context of the words right <coughs> okay so that was just a couple of different perspectives on how on what we can possibly mean by the context so when I say we'll be recording, we'll be looking at the context of words, we'll be using the context of words um, to say something about their uh, uh, their meaning and record these features. Just bear in mind that this context is something that it, it's, it's up to us to, to define. We get to decide um, in our model what, what the context should be. Okay, and then there's the even more basic concept of words so we haven't really said anything about what a word is in the first place um, you have looked at this a little bit on your own in the first obligatory assignment so there we asked you to look at tokenization so uh, in some of the pre-code you were given uh, um, there's functionality for reading text in from a file and um, so we read in, s in lines of text as a single consecutive string and then the task of, of tokenizing that string refers to sort of chopping it up, uh, up into word-like units. Um, so to just illustrate, so again there will be many uh, sort of design decisions that, that, that can enter into the process. Uh, so if you start with this raw uh, string of text, the programmer's programs had been programmed. Okay, for now, from the uh, perspective of the uh, uh, of a computer program trying to to deal with this, uh, these are are uh, this is just one consecutive string of text. Okay, it hasn't been carved up into individual words yet. So one simple approach to tokenization would be uh, like what it's done in in the pre-code for the first assignment. Basically, just looking for for white space um, and saying. E uh, anything separated by the rest of the text by white space or, bl or some blank is um, is to be regarded as a word. Um, one additional sort of piece of normalization that we might want to do is to also um, 
separate out to um, punctuation. So we might want to, for example, take care to separate the, s the sentence final period here and also the uh, apostrophe s here and say that these correspond to to individual tokens. So that would require doing something slightly more than just splitting on white space. Um, and typically we might also want to do some uh, some more morphological normalization. So most sort of normalizing these uh, these words that we extract. So the most basic basic thing uh, we typically want to do is make sure everything is lowercase, for example. Because for the sake of the example, that's what we'll do here. So here's an example of how this string could be tokenized. So um, we now chop this string into individual words and separated out the uh, uh, punctuation. Um, so there's a bunch of other normalization we could have done, like uh, normalizing numbers, for example, mapping them to one unique token. Um, but one thing we will discuss is to to further normalize using what's called lemmatization or um, stemming. Um, so with lemmatization refers to um, the process of mapping mapping words into their sort of base forms the form you typically find when you look up a word in a dictionary. Okay, so doing that here, we'd end up with uh, this set of words. The programmer, s, program, have, b, program. So for program here, we now have the infinitival form of the word instead of the, the past tense, and this gives us sort of fewer unique words to deal with. We've done this additional additional step of, of uh, normalization. We could go one step further doing what's uh, um, uh, called stemming, but first, um, looks like I wanted to say something about stop lists, uh, which is also something which is uh, often used. So weeding out uh, closed class words, uh, like the determiner, that for example, words on um, auxiliary verbs. Uh, the idea here is that only sort of um, content words contribute uh, in any meaning meaningful way to the, uh, the semantics of the, of the words or the sentence. So we typica typica typically uh, often uh, sort of throw out these very high-frequent closed-class words. So again, if we had filtered this, this set of lemmatized tokens through a stop list, we might end up with something like this, programmer, program, program. So these are now the only the words left from our initial raw string. And if now going on to what's called stemming, that's sort of an e even more aggressive form of normalization than lemmatization. So instead of trying to identify the, 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 the base form, the lemma of a word, one typically just strips off uh, the suffix of the word. So here, for example, if we had we might have identified only these prefixes of the of the words. We're left with program, program, program. <coughs> so stemming is something which is more typically done within uh, um, information retrieval approaches, for example. Whereas in in more sort of fine-grained linguistic approaches, one might want to to not go any further than than lemmatization. Okay, but th these various steps of normalization that we could potentially choose to, to include in our program um, obviously have, have consequences for what in the end we regard as a word. And if you look at sort of this, uh, so in the, in, the in the first assignment you're asked to, um, to look a bit at this distinction between types and tokens. So we're counting first the number of words, the, n the number of unique tokens that occur in the corpus that you read in, the total number of occurrences, and then later uh, we ask you ask you to look at the uh, um, the number of unique words in the corpus, which would correspond to what we call call types as opposed to, to tokens. So if you look at this stemmed version of this sentence, for example, we only have one, uh, one word type, actually, just program. 
if you look at our first tokenized ver version, each token uh, is a unique, unique word type. Okay, so that was a little bit about different ways of defining what a word is and different ways of defining what we mean by contexts. Um, what we still haven't said anything about is what we mean by being similar. So we started out saying that um, uh, by the end of this lecture and by the end of your next assignment, we, we want to be able to uh, have some, idea, s some way for a program to automatically uh, judge whether two words are, are similar. But what does that mean to be, uh, to be similar, to, have, to be similar in meaning? Um, and there are many different ways in which we can talk about semantic similarity. Um, and one main distinction that I'll mention is uh, that of relatedness on the one hand versus sameness or similarity in terms of domain or similarity in terms of, of content. So let's look at a couple of examples to make that a bit more concrete. So when I say similarity in terms of domain, I would refer to the types of similarities that hold between the words given in this example. So, so car is in some way related to words like road, gas, service, traffic, driver, license, and so on. Um, but obviously, we wouldn't say that car means the same thing as license or traffic, uh, traffic or gas or road. They're, ju they're just they're related somehow semantically in terms of belonging to the same domain. But uh, another way in which we can say that something is similar is um, illustrated by the examples that you see here. Car, train, bicycle, truck, vehicle, airplane, bus. So for these examples, we might to a larger degree say that these represent similar types of things. So car is similar to train or truck um, or bicycle even um, in another way than, it, uh, than it's similar to these other words in the, in the preceding example. So this latter example will correspond to what we call um, um, sameness or similarity in terms of content, while this first example refers to what we call similarity in domain or, or relatedness. Um, there's a tendency that the more sort of fine-grained contexts that we're recording, the more fine-grained linguistically informed um, contextual features that we that we record for the words that we want to model, um, the more the similarity similarities that we end up getting will reflect similarities in contents. Whereas if you record sort of broader, more coarse-grained features, like document level uh, bag of words features, there's a higher chance that the similarities, the semantic similarities that our model will be able to predict will reflect similarities in terms of domain. Okay, so the, but the similarities that we'll mainly be targeting in, uh, uh, in our uh, assignment will be mostly uh, similarities in term terms of content. <coughs> Okay, so we have looked at this overall idea about this distributional hypothesis, this contextual theory of meaning. We've talked about um, what we mean by words and context features, um, uh, but what we, we still haven't really said anything about is exactly how we can represent our words and how we can represent these features that we extract and how we can in practice of compare these sets of features that we extract. So that's what we'll turn to now, how we can actually represent all of this stuff in a well-defined mathematical uh, model that allows us to, to immediately reason about what, what, um, what words are actually similar and dissimilar. Um, and the overall model that we'll be using is something called vector space models. So a vector space model is sort of a very general framework for, for representing uh, 
data or wherever whatever it is we want to to represent it doesn't make any assumptions about um what is to be represented it's just sort of a general framework um which is based on this underlying um uh, geometrical or spatial um uh, metaphor so each object that we want to re represent will correspond to a point or a vector in a coordinate system and each coordinate or each dimension or axis uh, in our space or coordinate system will correspond to some measurable property, some kind of um, um, feature that we can um, uh, use for describing the objects that we want to, to represent. Um, and once we've represented something um, in this geometrical model, we can simply measure their geometrical distance in the model to be able to say something about uh, how, sim how similar or dissimilar two objects are. So to take um, a simple example that is uh, not related to, to natural language processing, just to, to get an idea of sort of how uh, uh, how general the framework is and to get some intuitions about uh, how it works in practice, we can think that we want to define a vector space model for uh, representing how similar uh, uh, students are or how similar uh, um, people are in, in general with regards to some set of, of physical traits or, or properties. So to it's, it's difficult to visualize su such a geometrical model if you have more than, than three dimensions because that's what we have available to us uh, in, uh, in real life, in our physical world. But in theory, a vector space model isn't restricted to sort of any given number of dimensions. We can have hundreds or thousands of dimensions, but to visualize it, we will typically stick to, to three because <laughs> it makes life a bit easier. Um, so we can imagine that we have uh, three dimensions that we want to use for describing the physical appearance uh, of someone. Um, so if we start with one dimension, with the, sort of the, the x-axis in our model, uh, this plane of our room, uh, correspond to, to height, for example, how tall someone are. Then we'd say that if someone is, is uh, very small, they would be positioned over at this end of the scale. Uh, so a baby would be over here, very low. If you're very tall, if you're Stefan, maybe I could borrow Stefan even. Um, <laughs> Stefan is a tall guy. Uh, he would score rel very high along this, this dimension. Okay, so Stefan would be way up on that, that end of the room. I'm sort of medium, medium height, so I would be maybe here. Okay, but for now we only have we only have this one dimension. This is the only dimension we have for comparing me and Stefan. All of you would also be sort of distributed uh, along this uh, this wall, right? And we could say something about. Um, already then we could measure geometrically how far it is uh, between us, and that would tell us something about uh, the difference in in height. But then we can add another dimension, like. Uh the length of uh, uh, someone's hair. Uh, again, I wouldn't score <laughs> very high. Let's let <laughs> that be the vertical dimension. Okay, so I would be, I would be down here. Uh, Stefan is sort of uh, uh, medium, so he would be sort of uh, in the middle of the room, but still over on on that end. Okay, and then we could add yet one more dimension, like the uh, uh, color of your hair, for example. So let's say blonde. It's in this end of the room, and if you have uh, dark black hair, you'd be over on that far end of the side, along that wall. Okay, so both me and Stefan, have sort of we would score sort of medium there. So Stefan would be over there in the middle of that wall, yeah, right where his, his head is now, actually, fittingly. Uh, I would be down at the floor uh, somewhere, somewhere around there, okay? So now we have three properties, three physical properties that we have decided on that we want to use for describing data points uh, or data, namely persons in this case, and by just mapping these properties into designated sort of axis or uh, 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 dimensions in this geometrical model, um, we're able to position our, uh, our data geometrically in, in this model. And immediately we're able to then measure the geometrical 
distance in a model. And then we're able to say something about how similar or how dissimilar two objects in the model are um, in terms of this in terms of physical resemblance in this case. But I mean our data points could be could be anything, right? In our case it won't be uh, people or me and Stefan, and it won't be sort of physical traits that we'll be looking at. Instead the data points will be words. And the dimensions in our model will be um, uh, properties that record the contexts in which words occur. And we won't have just we won't be limited to just three three dimensions. We'll have hundreds or thousands or I mean in practice you can have sort of several millions of dimensions in um, in these vector space models. Um, so if a vector space model um, uh, represents, uh, uh, it's used for representing word meaning, um, then we typically call them um, semantic spaces. Okay, so in a, in a semantic space model, um, uh, uh, the points in our model will, will represent words, and the dimensions will represent the contexts of use, and the, uh, the distance that we're able to measure in the space will represent Hopefully, if we have designed uh, decent features and seen enough data, they will re reflect semantic similarity. Um, seeing enough data is actually a key point here because uh, like in all sort of quantitative or empirical approaches to, to, to modeling language, uh, um, it sort of hinges on having enough data, having seen enough data that it's actually representative of, of the words uh, that we want to model. <coughs> okay, so um, what we'll be looking at for the remainder of the lecture is uh, how in practice we can define these vector values when I in a semantic space models when, when modeling words and how um, more concretely we can measure distance uh, in the model. Um, okay, so as I said, a vector space model is defined by um, a system of uh, uh, some given number of dimensions. The number of dimensions will correspond to the number of uh, contextual features that we, that we include in our model. And each object, in our case, each, each word, will rep be represented by some real valued vector um, in this space. Um, And in our case, for, for a given word, the value that a given uh, feature will have in the model will correspond to the number of, um, I mean, so, so a given feature will correspond to some type of context, right, that we can observe. And the value for that feature for a given word in our model uh, will correspond to the number of times that context was observed. Okay, so when in the example with me and Stefan, the values uh, corresponded to, for example, the length of uh, our hair or uh, how, how tall we were, okay? In a semantic space model, the values along the dimensions will correspond to the number of times a given context has been observed. Um, the values will correspond to, to basically frequency counts uh, uh, of these uh, uh, context features. Um, so for every word in our model, for a given word um, O, that will be represented by a feature vector X with um, n number of dimensions, uh, each element, each dimension recording uh, the number of occurrences of the, the corresponding uh, context <coughs> that that dimension encodes in the model. Um, so as an example, if we, in this case, assume that our contextual features correspond to grammatical relations. So remember the, the sentence uh, uh, about baking bread. So, uh, or baking cake seems to be the example in this case. Uh, so if we assume that the, the, the ith word in our model is the word cake, and the jth feature in our model corresponds to the context of having been observed as uh, the object of the verb bake, then looking at uh, the jth uh, 
uh, vector value for in the feature vector, uh, the ith feature vector corresponding to the word cake. If that value is four, that would tell us that we've observed the word cake as the object of of bake uh, in our text corpus for uh, uh, four times. Okay, so that's the kind of information that will be recorded in our uh, um, in our model. And each word will be will correspond to such a, uh, a given feature vector. So in the assignment you'll be you'll be given you'll be given sort of a predefined list of words with a uh, hundred and some some words in it that we want to include in the model. So for for each such word in the word list, you will need to create such a feature vector to represent it. Um, and in the assignment, the actual context that we'll be looking at will be bag of words features, so not grammatical relations, but um, uh, a bag of word approach. If you remember, that means uh, taking all other words co-occurring within the same sentence uh, um, as defining the context. So you'll be, um, each time you read in a sentence and you see one of the given target words that you want to model in that sentence, you will need to extract uh, uh, all the other words co-occurring in that sentence uh, and map those to features in your model. <coughs> okay, before we turn to to now how we can actually um, uh, compute geometrical distance in the model, I think uh, we'll make time for coffee first and then we'll start again uh, a quarter past. Okay, so now we have the we have the um, the words in place. Each word is represented as a feature vector in our model. Each dimension of these feature vectors corresponds to some contextual property that we've um, extracted for the words, as we've observed it in in actual language use in our corpora, right? Now we want to be able to to compare these feature vectors to to measure the distance between these feature vectors and then in terms of that distance in turn say something about how semantically similar um, different words are. Okay, so we'll basically the idea then is to to compute semantic similarity in terms of spatial or uh, geometrical uh, distance. Okay, and one standard such um, distance measure, when the standard metric that is used is what is called Euclidean distance, um, which is defined by the formula what you see here. Um, what Euclidean distance does is it computes the, uh, the so-called norm or, or the length of the difference vector given for, for two vectors. So we here have two vectors x and y, um, and we uh, um, intuitively it co corresponds to the the length of the distance um, between the two points, corresponding to the the length of that straight line co connecting uh, the two points. Um, so I said that it what it computes is the length of the difference of the vector. So if you look at the formula, you see that we we compute the difference of each element of the of the vectors. And then we take uh, what we call the norm. The norm is defined down here, which is the correspond to the uh, the rest of the e equation up here. <coughs> so we, we sum the square of each element and, and take the the square root in the in the end. Um, so one so this is a so Euclidean distance is sort of a very nice intuitive measure. It's sort of easy to understand, easy to in intuitively uh, get a grip on of what, what it means, but it also has some problems. So one problem is that it's it's sensitive to the uh, the magnitude or the length of the different vectors that we want to that we want to compare. Um, and in our case, that is uh, that can be a problem since words can occur with very different frequencies. So we might have some words in our text collection that that occur uh, very often. But we might have other words that 
uh, are, although they are semantically similar and mean roughly the same thing, maybe they occur very rarely. But we'd like that to, we'd like our model to sort of not be sensitive to such uh, spurious frequency effects. We'd like our model to be able to detect that two words share the same meaning or mean roughly similar things, even though one of them is very frequent and one of them uh, is rare. Um, and that's for Euclidean distance. Um, uh, can be tricky to use. So if you look at the example here, here we have um, uh, three points or uh, three vectors, A, B, and C. And here we see that uh, uh, A is uh, A and B will be judged to be uh, a long way uh, away from each other according to the Euclidean distance, whereas A and C will be judged to be um, closer together. And the main reason for this is just that uh, that B uh, corresponds to a longer vector. So it means that B has had more, it's been observed more frequent with wha whatever the uh, the context corresponding to the uh, y-axis here in our model corresponds to. <coughs> but we see we see that. Um, So, so what we'll see is that we, uh, there are other measures that instead look at the, the angle between these different vectors, disregarding the, uh, the length that the different, different vectors have. Um, but one other way of overcoming sort of this um, sensitivity to frequency inherent in the in Euclidean distance measure is to, um, to normalize all vectors. So to normalize their length um, to have a Euclidean length of one, or what, what we call unit length, um, or to be what we call unit vectors. So this can be done simply by dividing every element in our vector by uh, by its norm, by its length. And then all vectors will have the same, uh, all our words will have the same, uh, same length. <coughs> so that now if we, s if we have uh, uh, the same words A, B, C, we see that the vectors have the same orientation that they did on the previous slide, it's such that now they're all, you'll have, have, the, have the same length. Um, they all point to, uh, to the surface of uh, the so-called unit sphere. And now we see that A and B are suddenly judged to be uh, very close to each other, um, while A and C and B and C are judged to be uh, further apart. So this simple normalization step is uh, sort of an effective way to get past this uh, this frequency bias in the model. But there's also um, another measure we can use for uh, quantifying similarity that doesn't have this inherent bias, um, and that's the, the cosine measure. Um, and the cosine... Uh so first, it's a similarity function rather than a distance function. <coughs> One thing to bear in mind, and it, com it computes similarity as a as a function of the angle uh, between the vectors, um, and has a constant range between between zero and one. So if the if the vectors that we compare are uh, uh, perpendicular to each other, uh, the cosine will be zero, and if they have exactly the same orientation, the cosine will be one. And one nice thing about the cosine similarity is that um, uh, it doesn't have this uh, this frequency bias, since it since it looks at the uh, it's a function of the angle instead of the uh, the length of the, the vector. So you see that it has this length normalization uh, inherent by dividing uh, the dot product of the vectors on the uh, on their norms. But still, in practice, when using the cosine similarity for computing uh, uh, the similarity of, of points in our model, it can still be useful to perform length normalization of the vectors first. So requiring that all the vectors in our model are, are unit vectors. Since if we do so, uh, both of these terms will be one. Right, so we can throw that them out of the equation. And then all we're left with is uh, 
the dot product of, of x and y. So for, for normalized unit vectors, the, the cosine is, is simply the dot product, as you see here. So uh, basically the sum of all uh, uh, of the product of all the pairwise vector elements. Um, and that's something which can be uh, computed very uh, efficiently. So, um, so, so even when using the cosine, sort of conceptually, still length normalization is often is often done. Um, so I noted that uh, the cosine measures sort of closeness or proximity, as opposed to to distance, which is uh, computed by the Euclidean uh, Euclidean distance. But still, if we work with with these unit vectors, with these length normalized vectors, um, the Euclidean distance and the cosine will still give us the same relative ranking of words. So if, if you were to compute a ranked list of saying, so give, us, give me all the words that are most similar to the word uh, cake, then if you work with uh, normalized vectors, it wouldn't actually matter uh, whether we, we use Euclidean distance or the cosine to, to rank them. <coughs> The absolute scores would be different, but the, the rank order uh, in that list would be, th be the same. Um, and for the assignment, we'll also have you sort of implement these various uh, measures for, co for computing distance in the, uh, in the vector space model. Okay, but the idea now is that once we have this in place, we can now compute the, so applying this, this formula, for example, the, the dot product, we can now compute the distance of the vectors x and y in our model. x and y will correspond to represent two different words. Uh, the elements that we uh, iterate over when computing the sum corresponds to different contexts that we've observed and recorded. And depending on whether uh, uh and and depending on the score that, that that this gives for us, we're able to then say something about how similar the words represented by x and y are, how similar their their semantics is. Okay, a couple of practical comments when it comes to implementing this uh, for the assignment, um, and also more more generally. So conceptually, uh, this vector space model can be thought of. Um, a matrix. So the dimensions in our model can correspond to uh, the columns. It's one way to think of it. And each feature vector can correspond to, to a row. Right, so if you have m words that we want to model, and n features, or n dimensions um, in our vector space, uh, we can think of that as defining an m by n matrix, and m by n um, co-occurrence matrix, or frequency matrix. Um, but also note that we might end up recording extremely many uh, of these feature functions or these uh, uh, these contexts uh, from a corpora. So um, if you have a bag of words model, if you where each word co-occurring in the same sentence as the words you want to model will yield a feature or a dimension, then it's easy to imagine that if we have a large corpus, then our uh, our semantic space model will have extremely many dimensions, you know, hundreds or thousands or, or millions. Um, so in that sense, uh, our space is extremely high dimensional. Okay, but for each individual word that we want to model, so the word cake, for example, uh, in this model, um, we'll only have very few, uh, we'll, we'll only have observed very few of these features for that particular word. So for the word uh, cake, for example, we probably, th there's uh, you know, only a few contexts that we've actually uh, observed that word, and very many other contexts, most sentences in the corpus, we haven't seen that word. So what that means is that the, the number of of non-zero elements uh, in the feature vector for each word will be very low. So our, our space will be what we call uh, very sparse. We have a very high dimensional uh, space, but um, it's at the same time very sparse. So there will be very few active features for each word. 
Okay. Um, uh, these uh, two considerations have sort of important implications for how we should go about implementing this. Um, because we want to take care not to waste space representing all these zero-valued features. So if you have a, a vector space model with uh, 100,000 features, but lots of 100,000 sort of dimensions conceptually, but for each word, maybe on average, only 100 of them are, are actually active, then we want to take care to to do something smart when, when representing these word vectors. So we don't waste space on representing all these features uh, that are zero mm -hmm. in all the feature vectors. And at the same time, we also, when, when computing these various vector operations, like the, um, the vector norm or the dot product, we also want to take care to not waste time iterating over all these dimensions that, that have a zero value. So if we go back to the dot product, uh, so for any pair where, where either uh, xi or yi here uh, as a zero value, um, we wouldn't actually need to spend time uh, computing that product, right? Because it wouldn't it wouldn't contribute to the to the final sum. <coughs> okay, so that's these are some of the kinds of considerations that you will have to uh, take into account when when implementing this. Um, yourself in the in the assignment um, and sort of initially you can actually view sort of these formulas that we've looked at like the Euclidean distance and, and the dot product um, as more or less pseudocode that you can sort of translate more or less directly into uh, into common lisp common lisp code um, so once you see a sum sign, right? That means okay, time to to iterate over the uh, uh, over the feature vectors. But then again, it's important to 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 have this note about sparsity in mind, right? Because since the feature vectors are very sparse, you want to take care um, uh, that you don't end up wasting time iterating over uh, all the dimensions that conceptually are in our model if you don't need to. Um, one other problem th that is something we'll actually gloss over in, in our impl implementation <coughs> um, is a problem that raw frequency counts alone uh, uh, are not always the best, uh, um, the best data to use, the best indicators for, um, uh, for computing the similarities of words. So raw frequencies alone are not always the most relevant things to look at. So if we take an example, um, let's say we have these, again, we have grammatical features that correspond to, or we have contextual features that record the gram grammatical contexts of, word, of words. And let's say we've uh, looked at contexts for um, uh, the noun wine, for example, and we've seen that it occurs frequently as uh, an object of the verb by. And then we've seen it also occurs uh, somewhat frequently with uh, as an object of the of the verb pour, so to pour something. But again, if we think about it, I I although it has occurred more frequently as an object of by, the fact that it has occurred as an object of pour seems to be sort of more indicative of of what it means to be wine. It seems to be more seems to be a more relevant feature, right? And that because so many things can be bought, right? So we can expect that uh, very many words in our model will have a high value for, for this feature. Almost anything can be, uh, we can think of, it's almost hard to think of things that, uh, of, of nouns that uh, can't be an object of by, but only very few things can sensibly be an object of the verb to pour, right? So that seems like a more, more salient feature in our model and uh, we might want to try to take care to normalize our observations, our frequency counts um, uh, to, to bring that out. So one solution to this is to, to, um, to weight these raw frequency counts by some kind of so-called association function. 
So there are a bunch of different uh, statistical tests uh, that can be used. Um, things like the t-test, log likelihood, uh, mutual information. There are many different statistical uh, tests. Most of them take the take the form of statistical uh, hypothesis tests. Um, so uh, tests used for, for testing statistical significance. And these can be used to sort of measure the association between um, a feature uh, and a word. It can go some way towards cancelling out some of these uh, uh, raw frequency effects. But we'll, we'll we won't be implementing um, this step in uh, for our assignment 2A. Um, but it's worth knowing that, it's that this is something that, that is often performed as part of creating such a semantic space model. Okay, I thought we'd actually go back to to look quickly at some of the common data structures that we skipped uh, in the last lecture since in the um, uh, in the assignment you'll need to to um, to make informed choices about sort of what what data structures to use when for implement implementing um, uh, this co-occurrence matrix implementing your feature vectors Okay, so we'll quickly talk, quickly look jointly at some of the different um, data structures that we have available to us. So one thing we we did look look at, let's just remind ourselves, um, was this, uh, arrays. So common lisp arrays we uh, we actually covered. Um, all I wanted to say about arrays is that remember that um, they are whoops um, uh, integer indexed, so it means to to look up something in an array we need to use uh, a numerical key. Okay, <coughs> so if we if we wanted to to uh, to use an array for uh, representing a feature vector, for example, then we would need to take care to first map our features, which will be symbolic, right? They will be, be words. So for example, a feature could be bake, right? Co-occurring with the word bake. So to to map that into a vector, we would then first need to maintain some sort of symbol table. Um, where we map the symbol or, or the string bake into some numerical identifier that we can use for for looking it up and, and, and storing the count for that feature um, in our structure. Um, another th another thing to bear in mind is that when working with arrays, we need to specify uh, sort of the length in advance, the length that we want to that we want the array to have. So then it's worth thinking about what I said about. Um, sparsity and how uh, only very few of the features or dimensions that conceptually are part of our model um, that only very few of those will actually have a non-zero value an active value okay so arrays we did look at so some of them just skipping through some stuff that we have actually looked at um, but then we have a choice of several different structures for um, for uh, doing key value lookup um, and I thought I'd skip over property lists, but at least briefly mention association lists and uh, and hash tables. Um, okay, so let's skip to to association lists. So this is a data structure that um, uh, is built on built on lists. Um, there's a constructor s constructor called pairless, which we which takes um a list of keys and a list of associated values that you can use to to join together and create a, a so-called association list or an, or an a list for short so an a list is basically a list of pairs where the first element in each pair is the key and uh, the second element or the rest element of the pair uh, is the value okay and then there's a built-in function asoc that we can use to look up a given key. 
So the first argument to ASOC is uh, is the key, and then the, the A list, and that ret then that returns sort of the record or the field. Uh, if it is in the association list, if, if not, it just it just returns nil. So in this case, we look up artist and we get the record back with artist as a key and Elvis as the as the value. And again, we can use this generalized assignment operator setup that we've looked at. Um, for uh, for modifying uh, a list, so in this case we use that to update a variable in which we, we store the list, <laughs> and we use a cons um, to add a key and a value to an existing association list. Okay, so a cons basically takes the key and the value, creates a new cons cons pair, and adds that to the to the existing list. <coughs> And in terms of just a note on, on representation on on, uh, uh, on this dot, which is printed out if you when you if you do this on the REPL. So uh, we briefly talked about this this earlier, just to remind you that the dot means we have a so-called dotted pair. So meaning um, a cons pair where the rest part is not actually um, itself a list. So we have const uh, an atomic value to something something else than than nil or or um, or another list. Okay. So in terms of limitations, when it comes to association lists, I mean, association lists is one thing that we that we see we can immediately use for representing our feature vectors, right? Because we want to associate um, features. Like for example, the value, uh, uh, the feature having occurred with with bake, with some value, namely uh, in, this in our case not Elvis, but the the frequency count of how many times that given feature has been observed for the word that that has uh, has this feature vector. So a list is one possible choice, also in addition to arrays for for representing our our feature vectors. Um, the uh, it takes an additional test keyword, which I guess we're not actually showing here. But um, uh, ASOC ta takes an additional uh, keyword parameter called test, where we can specify the key the keyword arguments. Uh, um, no, specify the the test that we that we should use to compare keys when we do lookup, which means it's fine to use it for for strings, for example, as, as keys. Um, one thing to note is that when we look up things in an association list, it means that uh, in the worst case, we need to, to run through the entire list, right? So the it will be the, the complexity uh, of a lookup operation will be linear in the, in the length of the association list. So ASOC has to linearly search through the list, right? One element at a time until it finds a, a key that matches. So lookup is um, potentially expensive, but we, we see that one nice thing about a lists, of course, is that uh, the, the length here is flexible. So in terms of what we said about sparsity, now we don't want to necessarily represent uh, all features that conceptually sort of are there uh, in our feature vectors. We, we only want to want to take care to only represent features that are actually active for a given word. Okay, so one last data structure um, that you've already, uh, hopefully most of you have already looked at when working through uh, the first assignment, is hash tables. Um, so we've seen that lists can be inefficient if you have, uh, uh, if you want to do associative lookup on uh, on large data sets, right? Because it has this linear complexity. And we see that arrays are restricted to numeric keys. Um, but the, one the nice thing about hash tables is that they can efficiently uh, uh, handle many keys and almost any uh, type of key. So we can specify uh, the test function uh, that we want to, to use for doing lookup in, in a hash table. It can be either, either of the built-in uh, equality tests that we talked about last time. So to create a hash table, 
we have the constructor ma make hash table. It takes this keyword parameter specifying the test to be used for, for lookup. And there's get hash for looking things up in the table. Uh, in this case, we look up the string foo and it returns nil because it's it's not in the table. And again, we can use this generalized set of assignment operator uh, directly on the get uh, get hash operation. Uh, so we here say that uh, we call get hash on the on the key foo on our table, and we say that 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 should have uh, the value 42 inserted. So if you now try to look up foo, we will get 42 back. There's a nice um, trick which you should be should know about um, when working with, with hash tables. That is that you can do you can test whether a key is in the table. Um, and possibly insert it if it's not in the table, and also update it in in one step, all in one go. So if you remember, incf is uh, this specialization built on top of the the setf operator for uh, for modifying um, numerical uh, values. So. Uh you can uh, get hash also takes a third argument which you see here the zero so in addition to the key and the actual table it takes a third argument which specifies the default value so what we're saying here is that uh, look up the key bar give us whatever value that has in our table if it's not in the table then return the value zero instead but then here we also use incf to say uh, that we want to increase the value by one that this that this key has in the in the table. So this will, if it's not in the table, it will add bar to the table with a value of zero and then increase that. If it is in the table, it will just increase whatever value is already in there. So that's nice thing to know about to make the code a bit a bit shorter uh, when you're when you want to do all these things uh, in one. Uh, there are also some specialized um, directives for doing iteration over hash tables. So there's map hash, and there's also uh, support for iterating over both hash keys and hash values in um, in loop that we spent some time on in the in the previous lecture. Okay, so that was just a quick tour of some of the most sort of central data structures that might be relevant to to uh, some of the implementation choices that will be left um, for you to make in, in this next assignment. Um, so finally, just wanted to say a bit about where we're headed um, for the next week. So the um, next week we'll start talking about how to, to compute so-called neighbor relations in this in these semantic space models that we've talked about today, and also so so far we've only talked about how to represent single data points, how we can represent um, one word type, or how to represent one person like me and Stefan in uh, in a vector space model. Um, but in the next lecture we'll, we'll talk a bit more about how we can represent classes, how we can represent groups of objects um, in these in these models uh, we'll also talk about how we can represent class memberships so how we can uh, if we think of various objects or data points in our model belonging to to these different classes um, there are various ways to to both compute and represent the these these class memberships and finally, we'll turn to talk about um, classifiers. So an instance of what we call supervised uh, supervised machine learning algorithms. And we'll be looking specifically at um, K-nearest neighbor classification uh, and Rocchio uh, classification. And this will, so, so all the stuff we'll cover in the next lecture and the lecture after that sort of this builds directly on what we've said today. So we'll we'll keep on working with vector space models and semantic spaces, and then we'll just sort of add more stuff to that picture. Um, and the same goes for, it's probably a bit early to scare you about assignment 2b when 2a isn't already out, but in 2b you'll actually be implementing um, 
some of these classifiers that we'll uh, talk about in the in the next lecture and that will sort of build on the code that you that you write for uh, for this coming coming assignments and just a sort of very brief notes on on classification that basically refers to algorithms that uh, given some existing sets of examples about what objects belong to to different classes uh, so for example what words belong to various conceptual categories um, build a model that will be able to automatically predict the class labels for new previously unseen uh, objects or unseen unseen data points okay but that's for for next week uh, we still have a couple of minutes to go but that's that was it for for this week see you in a week